Okay, marketers, it's time for us to put marketing back where it belongs, in the center of business. Time to put a marketer at the very heart of every business. Time to put us marketers back in control of marketing. With due respect to the great David Packard, marketing is too important not to be left to marketers. The centrality of marketing deserves recognition. Marketing is the only management discipline which responds to human needs and so creates a sustainable flow of income for a business. Your job in your company is the only function that creates income for your business. As we say in our very first two-minute masterclass, no marketing, no income. No income, no profits. No profits, no business. No business, no jobs. No jobs, well, we stop there. No marketing, nothing. Central we are and indispensable we are. Digital is not. Marketing was around filling needs and generating sustainable income long before digital was born. Okay, so digital is novel, it's powerful, it seems revolutionary, but it's just a tool. Digital, we should keep reminding ourselves, is just a medium of communication. The medium which carries the message to its target. Important in the communication process, yes, but still a medium. And far less important in the value creation process than the persuasive message it carries. So, time, fellow marketers, to put the genie back in the bottle. Put digital back in the marketing toolbox where it belongs. A medium to carry our message to a target audience. And time to go back to the very basics of marketing and pose the fundamental questions, what is marketing, what is marketing for, and what can it do for your business and for you? We granddads know the answers, and we share them in three playlists here on YouTube, Marketing in Essence, Marketing in Contexts, and Marketing at Work. We think you'll find these microclasses provocative, illuminating, and maybe even life-changing, but there are 55 to choose from, so here with a summary. Our model for marketing best practice and value creation is seated in Cincinnati, Ohio. Some guys you've already heard of, the Procter & Gamble Company, P&G. I won't waste your time here justifying that choice. If you're interested, we have classes where we dig deep into P&G. But for now, please trust us. They are the best. They invented modern marketing. They invented brand management. They were voted marketer of the 20th century by the editorial board of Advertising Age. No one manages brands better. And we would be wise, all of us would be wise, to pull back the covers and to observe what P&G has been doing for nearly 100 years and how they do it. So what are Procter's secrets? And no one is more secretive than P&G. And when they are disclosed, what does P&G teach us? Effective marketing is all about brands. Marketing is not an end in itself. Marketing should be viewed as a toolkit. In the hands of a trained marketer, the marketing toolkit builds value and the value resides in a brand. In a capitalist world, that value must flow to the brand's owner as a financial asset which can be measured and distributed when the owner decides to sell the brand, capitalize it, or trade it. If marketing does not build measurable and distributable value for a brand's owner, it fails. So marketing must sell brands, must make a profit, but most importantly, must create and build brand value for the owner or shareholders as a financial asset. In commerce, owner's value flows from an expectation of sustainable profits derived from predictable sales of the brand, and that expectation comes in turn from the value of the brand perceived by its customers, which manifests itself in the loyalty with which customers reward the brand. So if a brand is to acquire financial value, it must secure customer loyalty. And if we marketers are to market effectively, we must seek loyalty for our brands. Loyalty will not occur spontaneously. It must be engineered by marketers and at the expense of competitors. The mind of the customer should be seen as a battlefield on which there can only be one victor, the marketer's brand. The marketer must see off the competition in the mind of the customer. To the potentially loyal customer, the brand's value must be seen as greater than that of the competition. Loyalty can only result from repeated experience of the product of which the brand is the face, reinforced by the marketer's advocacy of the brand's merits. What are known as the two key tools, the central two P's of the marketing mix, product, including service, and promotion, better described as communication. There are those that believe that having a better product than the competition is enough, that the customer can be coaxed into loyalty to a brand solely by its product or service. Unfortunately, that just is not so. One P is not enough. Product alone cannot create loyalty to a brand. Of course, the product must speak for itself. The product must be good. But the product and the brand need an advocate. In a world crowded with competitors, the marketer must speak loud, clear, repeatedly, convincingly and competitively of brand merits before, during and after the experience, which we do through marketing communication. Let's go through that again because it really matters. Your product must speak for itself. 
But it isn't all about product. It is all about loyalty. And loyalty to a brand comes brick by brick, word by word, image by image, drop by drop, through communication, which is our territory as marketers. The difference between product and brand is nicely summed up in the old saying, people buy and use products, but they choose brands. And we persuade them to choose our brand and recommend our brand over and over again. We create the perception of value through communication content, the message we communicate, not by the medium or the platform, channel, pathway by which the message arrives at the customer, the message content. Please, please don't get carried away by digital. In the context of message delivery, it is just another medium. It's a hell of an exciting one, a palette with limitless creative potential, but it is still just a medium. I know it's awesome, but then so was TV in the late 1940s, so was Caxton's printing press 550 years ago, and so probably was papyrus thousands of years back. Believe me, TV, Facebook, radio, print, word of mouth, all media. To build loyalty, we tailor the message content to convince each and every customer every time we speak that our brand is either better than its competitors or at least it is different. To convince each customer every time we speak that it is our brand and only our brand which exclusively meets or exceeds or anticipates the needs and wants of that customer. We beseech you as ambitious marketers, ambitious for your brand and ambitious for yourself, take control of the message content and fight like ferrets in a sack to have total control of every message to every customer, every time, whatever the media. By controlling the message content, the key tool of the marketing toolkit, you morph from stonemason to architect. You build cathedrals. Stand tall, marketers. But from those of you already in mid-career, I think I hear a groan. What the hell have cathedrals got to do with me, you cry? Whatever else I do, I do not control anything. I manage bits of a brand. I manage projects. I manage the boss. Well, I try to. I manage a few other dudes in the company. I do digital. I network. I teamwork. I committee. I engage. I communicate. I am beyond conscientious and hardworking. I even have fun from time to time. But I don't control message content, and I'm not going to be allowed to, ever. Someone else does that, you say. Somewhere else. Probably in his Tesla, on the golf course, or in his private jet. The CEO controls the brand. Larry and Sergi control the brand, or Jeff, or Mark, or Bill, or Ed. They invented the brand. They built it and they control it. I don't, and I don't control what everyone says about it. I don't control the message content at all. I don't build cathedrals, you protest. I doubt if I will ever build a hen coop. Wrong. You're going to build a heck of a site more than a hen coop. You're going to get control of the message content, and you're going to build a high-rise. To last. It's tough, but you're going to get there. So how do we put ourselves back in the driving seat? How do we get control of the message content? From our colleagues, from our bosses, our partners, our agencies, from all those with their fingers in the message pie right now. In your battle for control, and yes it is a battle and always will be a battle, not for the faint-hearted, your weapon of choice must be a short text. Perhaps on a piece of paper, perhaps on your PC, perhaps on your tablet or smartphone, it doesn't matter as long as the text is right. The purpose of our text is simple, to ensure that every message has the same competitive objective, to convince and persuade customers of our brand's comparative merits every time, on every impact, in every medium. You may describe the text as you wish. It is your text. You may name it. We name it a copy strategy, which is, as we divulge in our classes, what they call it at the Procter & Gamble Company, P&G, who invented it. But it doesn't matter what you call it as long as you create it. Here is an example, and it's very short. A good copy strategy should fit on Twitter and not exceed 280 characters or about 50 words. If it's more than that, it's woolly, and you want clarity, not wool. Wool is for sweaters. It's not for strategies. Brand X communication will convince customers, Y, that Brand X offers unique functional and or emotional benefits, Z, and will therefore satisfy their needs better than any competitor. You may include an optional reason why, or permission to believe, to provide credibility to the strategic promise. Now let's suppose you were brand manager of the iPhone. Your copy strategy might run, iPhone will convince young, early adopters of mobile phones that iPhone offers the unique combination of technical wizardry and high fashion appearance, which will attract the admiration and envy of their peers for one who possesses the latest iPhone. How do you use a copy strategy once you have written it? Well, first, you don't give up anything you're doing right now. You do your job, you deliver the goods required of you, you do the business. 
But every time you directly supervise any communication, an email, event, website, press release, an invoice even, bend the creative to communicate your strategy. Second, get others on side, and this will take time. Persuade others you work with, subordinates, reports, colleagues, bosses, agencies, to buy into your strategy. It doesn't matter if you have to modify it, as long as everyone has just one strategy text at one time, so you speak with one voice. Make sure everyone has a copy of the current text to refer to. Make sure it is always overtly competitive. Make sure every message is on your strategy. Bit by bit, you will take control of the way the brand's value is perceived by customers, which of course is everything, and loyalty will build. This is not the place to elaborate on copy strategies. It could take a very long time. If you still have your doubts, come to one of our classes and let's start debating. But if you like the idea, go for it and get going. Write your strategy and start executing it. Together, by taking control of the message, we are going to take back control of our brands and take control of marketing. It all starts here and ends, well, who knows where it ends. We might even build some cathedrals together. The financial value of the Google brand is between $142 billion, says Interbrand, and $495 billion, say its shareholders via the share capitalization. That is some building. Anyone ready to build? Hope to see you again at a two-minute masterclass. They are short, practical, and they're free. Whether you join us or not, however, good hunting from the Cambridge Grandads.